Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining us. We're going to give it a couple of minutes here to fill the room up. Good afternoon again, everyone. We're going to give it about one more minute to fill the room up. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on the burden of problem joints with hemophilia. My name is Brett Spitali. I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. If at any point during the webinar you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community on Friday uh, this Friday. I'm joined today by Paul McLaughlin. Paul is a clinical specialist and physiotherapist in hemophilia at the Catherine Dormandy Hemophilia Center at the Royal Free Hospital in London. In 2000, he completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Ulster in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and his master's degree in advanced physiotherapy at King's College London in 2009. He is currently undertaking a National Institute for Health Research funded PhD investigating the use of exercise-based rehabilitation in the management of pain associated with hemophili hemophiliac anthropathy. He is the uh, past chair of the HCPA, a UK group of specialized physiotherapists working in hemophilia. He is a founding member and current vice chair of the EAHAD Physiotherapy Committee and a member of the Musculoskeletal Working Party of the UK HCDO. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Paul. And I'll now turn it over to you to get us started, sir. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, thank you to the NHF for the kind invitation to talk to you uh, this evening for me, 7 p.m. here in London. I hope you're all well. <clears throat> um, I'll just give a slightly brief introduction. I know that was my biography. Um, so as I say, my name is Paul. I am a physio who lives and works in London in the UK. Um, background is a musculoskeletal physio and I've been based at the Royal Free in Hampstead which is in North London for a long time. I've been specialised in haemophilia for 15 years now and that is uh, I'm full-time in haemophilia care because um, the Catherine Dorman Haemophilia Centre is one of the largest haemophilia uh, centres in the UK. Um, as Brett alluded to I'm currently um, two-thirds, three-quarters through my NIHR doctoral fellowship. I'm looking at pain management and haemophilia and I have to say, I, I love my work in hemophilia. Um, I, I feel very blessed and very uh, privileged to work in um, uh, this uh, community. Um, the photograph say on the right hand side, that's our hospital looking very 1970s and gray, uh, but just behind the hospital is Hampstead Heath. Um, and that is the view um, over London uh, from Hampstead Heath. So if you ever get a chance to visit, uh, come and say hello and um, go up the, the hill and have that view, it's amazing. So, the aims and objectives of today's uh, webinar um, is to really review language and the terms that we currently use in haemophilia when we talk about joint health um, and sort of try and get an understanding of what makes up a joint a problem for someone with haemophilia and a problem in haemophilia. Discuss what we mean by uh, burden when we're talking about uh, joint health in haemophilia. Um, sort of present uh, towards the end and, and hopefully for discussion about how we, people with haemophilia and their healthcare teams um, can work together to try and ease the burden um, of living with problem joints. Uh, and we'll hopefully have uh, a nice um, conversation and good chats at the end about that because um, this is 
something I find myself um, very interesting and actually um, hugely emerging field and, and a, a real active issue, um, I think, for many people within the field today. So I think when we when we consider hemophilia, seeing it as a long term condition helps to contextualize perhaps the, the multifaceted um, issues that we as clinicians face, but also people living with hemophilia um, are living with and face. Um, when you have hemophilia, you have to deal with the symptoms and the disability um, that comes with your uh, condition um, and the emotional impact of those. You have to understand your complex medical regime um, and you have to implement that. And with the implementation of that, of your regime and also with your uh, long-term condition, there may be difficult lifestyle adjustments uh, to make, to incorporate it into your day-to-day -day, uh, well-being and living. You need to um, obtain a helpful and supportive medical care. Um, and actually that can add a lot of pressure um, to yourself and to your family and your caregivers um, if you feel that you're perhaps not being listened to um, or that the care you're having isn't actually meeting all of your needs. And you do have to deal with the demands on your physical, psychological and social aspects of your life. And actually it's beginning to show this picture of, of, of you know, you are uh, the, the, a person with a condition rather than a, um, a condition on its own. Um, and that people live with this and that people have lives around their conditions and actually beginning to understand that um, and, and where haemophilia sits um, within that. You don't need me to tell you about the bleeding nuisance of haemophilia. Um, we know um, that, so today I'm talking predominantly about joint bleeding, um, but we know that there is musculoskeletal bleeding. Um, but most of the muscle, uh, most of the bleeding in joints and muscles happens um, in the elbows, knees and ankles in the untreated state. And the bleeding itself um, begins to change the joint anatomy, changes the joint uh, shape, the joint structure, um, and how the joint itself uh, begins to behave then with these physiological changes, where there's the uh, thickened synovium, the extra blood vessels that come with the repeated attempts at healing um, after bleeding. And eventually um, you get the, the, the sort of the joint damage that is permanent then um, where you have uh, joint changes, extra bone growth um, and, and anatomical and, um, and sort of deformation. After the bleeding, after many bleeds comes the, the, the process of arthropathy and that's what it is, it is a process. Um, the diagram on the right hand side of your screen looks very complicated and it is, it's a, um, a sort of biochemical explanation as to why we think the cartilage and joints breaks down because of bleeding. But essentially uh, the, the cells within a, the cartilage in, in, in a joint do not respond very well to being covered or exposed to blood. And they, when the chondrocytes are called, when they die, they um, are not able to be replaced. And so it's this, this um, losing the chondrocytes and losing the cells that make up the cartilage structure and the cartilage strength that actually um, permits hemophilic arthropathy to take hold, to begin to change the joint shape. And then obviously with the, the, the anatomy and the physiological changes comes the functional changes that actually um, Perhaps you weight bear differently, you walk differently, you uh, move differently, you perhaps avoid activities that you would normally have done before, you decrease the amount of activity you do. And so all of those things, you know, the arthropathy is there, but actually the presence of arthropathy, and for indeed for many people in more than one joint, is, is problematic. And actually the, the joints themselves may if you have a, a problem right ankle you may well have a problem left knee that actually they begin to play off each other uh, negatively and so if you only see you know if you only treat an x-ray you will say oh that's a terrible knee we need to do a replacement that is an ankle that's got some damage in there you know and um, we need to do something about that we need to do orthopedic surgery we need to you know if, if it's bleeding we need to give some more factor and um, or we need to look at pain relief um, and the assumption that everything in these pictures is painful as well. Um, but actually I can tell you that I, these are pictures of uh, x-rays of my patients. And I know that for many of them, the, the x-ray may look terrible from a, a, an orthopedic perspective, but actually the, 
you know, the guy with the knee replacement there has had the other, that other knee has been like that for 25 years. So he's learned to accommodate that. And although it's orthopedically problematic for him, it's not that problematic currently. Um, he has a, a painful elbow, which is more difficult for him. So you can kind of begin to see the danger of, of focusing only on arthropathy, focusing only on an x-ray and not actually taking into account who that, who that joint is attached to, the actual human that is walking around with, um, with joints that look like that. We're currently in a, a, a golden age of haemophilia uh, treatment. Um, and this is recently published um, last year, this sort of overview of a timeline of, of the haemophilia success story for medicine and the fact that in a relatively short space of time, we've gone from no treatment availability to a, a, a plethora of, of options that treaters have to, to, to manage uh, the bleeding uh, in people with haemophilia. And this looks lovely. It looks completely success story. It looks, it's, everything's amazing. But actually what this graph doesn't include is the human story. And that actually, although bleeding has changed and treatments have improved, um, just because you stop bleeding or you stop multiple bleeding, it doesn't remove, take away or cure the previous effects of, of what has happened with that bleeding. And actually, it doesn't, you know, always remove the, the fears that were associated with living in the 50s, the 60s and 70s, when perhaps messaging around being active and physically, uh, physical exercise and activity was prohibited or viewed very uh, uh, negatively. Uh, life expectancy has, has improved massively as the years have gone on. But essentially, you can kind of see in the arrows in the middle here that <clears throat> The, the comorbidities, the, the sort of the things that are that people are living with that are related indirectly to their haemophilia, in the sense that they may not be bleeding now if they're on prophylaxis, but they may have three, four, five joints that have been affected by haemophilic arthropathy, and beginning to understand more and think differently about how we view people um, with haemophilia who are on better treatment regimes now. Um, have better access to care and treatment, but are living with multiple problems um, of their previous life with haemophilia. And this is beginning to, to get to the, the nub of what we're talking about problem joints and, and um, sort of beginning to understand the individual affected rather than the coming at it from their, their, their conditions. So rather than coming at it from haemophilia, we come at it from the person who is currently living with haemophilia, which actually may sound the same, but it's, it's, it's not. Um, you're taking a human view first um, of, of what it's like to live with that condition and the things that come with it. So the bleeding, then what? And this sort of begins to take us into this, the, for many years, what has been the medical view and the medical assessment of bleeding um, uh, as, a, as a basic determinant of success of treatment, and that's the annualized bleed rate. And I put this question sort of, who is it useful for this annualized bleed rate? And you know, the obvious answer is everyone. Um, I think 10, 20, 30 years ago, ABR was an exceptionally useful method of identifying the success of treatment. Uh, if you weren't on prophylaxis and you had an ABR 15 to 20 and you became on prophylaxis, where your ABR then becomes one or two or three per year, that's a huge improvement that, that goes hand in hand with access and availability of, of regular treatment. But it itself remains um, a, a measure with value, but it does need context. And the, the context is beginning to understand that the, the, the bleeding moment itself needs to be given context, but the context of the person who has experienced the bleed also needs to be explored and understood as well. So in, in a sort of modern era where we have um, better treatments and access to treatments, we sort of sit, consider joint bleeding now as, as truly spontaneous um, if it's target joint related. And so that's around, is there structural issues? Is there something, um, you know, are the extra bits of, of osteophyte bone and the extra bone changes beginning to, to nip at the, the lining and make it bleed? Is that target joint related to 
the, the insufficient factor levels that actually you need a higher trough to stop your joint bleeding because it's got a lot of synovium in there. Uh, traumatic. And this idea of how much trauma um, is, is needed for a joint to bleed. Um, if you are on regular prophylaxis, the trauma may well be normal. You would have to experience a normal amount of trauma for somebody with light hemophilia to bleed. Um, but also the, the idea around factor levels um, on, and, and luck, it is just sometimes it's just bad luck that things happen. And it, it, there's, there is no amount of planning can get around that. Um, and this idea of treated bleeding, um, and this is where we have this gray area where we as clinicians cannot be 100% certain that if you have chronic arthropathy with hemophilia, that there's a complete lack of bleeding if you're on treatment. Um, we're fairly sure that if you're on regular prophylaxis and you have good trough levels, it's unlikely that if you have arthropathy, you may be bleeding or subclinically bleeding, but we don't know. And we have this idea of, of treated bleeding where um, you have breakthrough pain or breakthrough uh, sensations in a, a joint that's arthritic. And sometimes giving extra factor makes it go away. And sometimes giving extra factor for pain doesn't change it. And so, you know, we're still working that out um, as we go forward. And then, of course, the whole idea of untreated bleeding, um, where you've got little or no access to, to, to sort of any sort of uh, coagulation or hemostatic uh, treatment regime. And I think now is the time with the current um, things that we have to treat bleeding is to ask, is this now, is this continue to be enough? Is it still a useful measure um, if you're on an extended half-life product uh, to ask about ABRs? Um, and I would perhaps put out there tentatively that no, it's not. An ABR at this stage is perhaps a very gross attempt to look at success of treatment. Um, and if you're on good prophylaxis, you may have an ABR that is zero, um, which looks like a complete success story on paper from a hemostatic management. But actually, this is where we get into the language and, and what we mean um, around sort of breakthrough bleeding and joints that bleed um, when they're in a treated or untreated state. So the current sort of um, this idea of target joint and a problem joint. Um, the target joint definition uh, presented by the ISTH in 2014, um, and this is the, the sort of internationally accepted definition, I think, for most people, um, is a target joint is a joint that has three or more spontaneous bleeds into a single joint. So that is your right knee or your left elbow, three joints, uh, three bleeds into the same joint over a consecutive six month period. So it's quite tight, quite precise definition. But if you're on an extended half-life product, if you're on a different product or you may not actually be bleeding, uh, just because you don't have a target joint doesn't necessarily mean that you're not experiencing problems living with the after effects of, of your hemophilia. And this is where in 2019, the team got together led by Jamie O'Hara, um, <clears throat> trying to look at this, um, at, at look at the definition differently and look at it from the position of someone living with a joint that is affected. And this idea of the problem joint or this definition of the problem joint came about from that. And so the problem joint is the presence of chronic joint pain with or without limited range of movement um, that is there because of a compromised joint integrity. So there may be chronic synovitis and or hemophilic arthropathy, and there may or may not be persistent bleeding. So you can see we're beginning to <clears throat> move away from, <clears throat> excuse me, bleeding as the only uh, useful outcome uh, within a joint specific uh, area in one person and actually begin to look at range of movement, begin to look at pain, begin to look at um, the presence of, there may not be active bleeding, but there may be chronic synovitis, which actually brings with it its own problems around um, synovitic pain and joint swelling and, and, and things like that. And so when you start to shift your, your mindset a little bit, you can kind of see that Looking at a target joint definition, it's very time limited and it's not very person centric. It's very disease centric. It's very much about hemophilia and bleeding. Whereas the problem joint 
attaches no time limit to that. If, if any of these things exist, they exist. Um, and it's about the person living with that joint reporting uh, when asked or, or reporting um, to their healthcare provider that these are problems for them. So the, the responsibility for the reporting changes a little bit, but actually the mindset around what is important perhaps changes. Um, and I'd be very interested to hear um, your views on this towards the end of the talk. And to sort of go deeper into those definitions, so although they look fairly simplistic, actually problem joints may themselves be target joints. The, you know, the two, the two can and will exist together in, in some people. Um, but problem joints may also not be target joints. So actually we're moving away from this idea that there has to be the full definition of a target joint of, of, of three bleeds in a single joint over six months. And target joints themselves may also not be problem joints. I certainly have had patients um, where they have bled, they have recorded bleeding in a joint um, that fulfills the definition of target joints, but they have been on prophylaxis. And so if they've had three joint bleeds over the space of six months and they've, they've been mild joint bleeds or they've treated them quite quickly, although they fulfill the definition for target joint, actually they, perhaps when they push and ask them about it, they don't really see that joint as a problem. It was just something that happened. They treated it and it went back to their normal. So, you know, the two don't always um, go hand in hand as we may expect them to. And I think this last one's really important. A problem joint is what the person who has the problem joint says it is. Um, and I think we need to get away that from the idea that, you know, for something to be a problem joint for anybody with hemophilia, that we have to have some implicit evidence of bleeding for it to be sort of attached to the hemophilia directly. Um, and it, this idea that uh, somebody living with the after effects of hemophilia becomes much more involved in reporting to their healthcare provider the, the things that matter to them um, and the, think the, the problems that they're having uh, uh, with joints that are problematic and they may be bleeding, may be painful, may be stiff, um, or it may be functional. It may actually be that they have none of those, but actually they have a joint that stops them doing something they want to do. And so what makes a joint problematic. Um, and is it the same for everyone? I would say no. Um, because if, if it was the same for everyone, we probably wouldn't be having this webinar, we wouldn't have this conversation and everybody would have a list of things they need to do if they fulfilled the criteria for what a problem joint would be. And I think this comes back to this idea of bleeding and joint problems being sort of viewed through a biomedical lens. Um, so the fact that it's always attached to hemophilia, it's always attached to the condition, it's always attached to bleeding. And that is problematic in itself. Um, and I think you know, we are seeing a shift away from um, sort of hemostatic outcomes of bleeding and human, humanistic sort of person-centered outcomes um, of which bleeding may be there, but actually it may also not be there. Um, and so when we sort of look at the, the traditional model of, of joint bleeding and, and problems in hemophilia, you've got the person with hemophilia, you've got their diagnosed severity. So traditionally um, severe and moderate hemophilia uh, traditionally have more problems associated with joint damage because of bleeding. And then you have this sort of <clears throat> biological, or as we term biological um, problems around sort of the bleeding, the disease itself, the physicality of that person because of their, their disease their, and their condition, any other comorbidities that may come with that. Access to prophylaxis um, is a social issue and a biological issue because prophylaxis and adequate treatment stops bleeding. And then you have joint health. And then within joint health is joint movement, joint pain, joint bleeding, and joint stiffness. But you can kind of see that that still remains quite um, uh, anatomical, quite uh, nondescript um, and, and, and very biomedical, um, which for many years was fine. And that's actually it needed a biomedical approach because the biggest problem in hemophilia was lack of treatment. But we're now perhaps at a stage where we need to consider that person with hemophilia and their problem joint actually exists in a life. 
they exist a little bit in their healthcare issues. So they may visit the hemophilia center once or twice a year. The rest of the time they are a person living with hemophilia and everything that comes with it. They need to work. They may want to work. They may not be able to work. They have their home. Um, that's both the physical environment of home, but also um, the, the sort of what they do in their home environment um, and their locality. The need to go to school, uh, being able to choose to go on holiday wherever you want to go rather than sort of um, and do the activities you want to do. Um, that person exists in a family with friends um, and, and people around them that they, they love and they spend time with. And so <clears throat> when you begin to appreciate how a target joint as a joint that bleeds within this exists, it becomes quite stale and um, difficult to, to sort of explain the, the human context. But actually, if you look at that person in the middle living and trying to, to explain what about their joints is problematic and what it may stop them doing or what it interferes with. Um, a joint bleed may stop you going to work, but you treat yourself and you can go to work on Thursday or Friday. But a problem joint may stop you doing the job you want to do, or you may have to retire early. Or it may mean that your employer asks you perhaps not to come back. Or so, you know, a, a bleeding joint is an episodic issue that can be managed and often can be hidden. Um, but a, a sort of ongoing problem joint begins to infiltrate into various parts of your, your well-being, various parts of your, your patchwork of your life. Um, and how you then begin to develop coping mechanisms and how, you, how that begins to affect you personally is really, really important, I think. And this is where we look at sort of defining then, if we look at sort of problem joints within the, 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 the burden of what they are. As we say, if we <clears throat> only focus on the, the x-ray, we miss the human, humanistic quality, we miss the, the effect on life quality um, and actually we're really trying to push from that x-ray level of, of medicine and bleeding down to actually you know how is the person behaving in uh, in their um their quality of life and whatever that means right? what is a good quality of life for me is not a good quality of life for you everybody has their own um approaches their own values their own belief systems and um my painful knee experience will not be the same as your painful knee experience and so it's beginning to, to understand um, what may make a burden for someone uh, and, and how we begin to view burden of problem joints rather than view um, a burden of, of bleeding. Um, and this is where we're into the language. And so this has been done um, or it's beginning to be done. So the chess data sets um, uh, is a, a project that's been going on for quite a few years now led by Jamie O'Hara and his team um, and they did had a look at the chess data sets and they started to look at applying this problem joint definition um, and analyzing the data that they had so the chess uh, project is the cost of hemophilia in Europe a socioeconomic survey and so they did a massive um, data collection across treaters and people with hemophilia in Europe eight European countries um, that was chess one. Chess two and the chess pizza came after that actually began then looking a little bit more at this idea around problem joints and, and, and collecting extra bits of data there. You can kind of see the data sets are really quite quite large. Um, chess two had adults with severe moderate haemophilia, um, almost 500 people involved in that. Chess pizza, the children, moderate and severe haemophilia across five countries um, had just under 800 uh, children. And as with all of these things, most of them were severe. Uh, more recently, uh, the team have looked at um, a chess uh, US data set. Um, it's a bit smaller, but that is, uh, I suspect, ongoing. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the chess US was only adults with severe hemophilia. Um, and they currently looked at 345 adults, 75% of whom were in prophylaxis and 25% on demand. And these data, data sets looked at applying the problem joint um, idea, the problem joint definition to uh, humanistic 
qualities within the the data set so looking at quality of life looking at pain um, and, and and things like that and so what did they find so with an increasing number of problem joints so going from zero uh, for some people up to sort of five or six problem joints as identified by them and their treaters there was an overall quality decrease in quality of life identified the increasing number of problem joints came with an increasing uh, amount of uh, what was reported as severe pain. There was an increased report in ABR, and this is where this starts to begin to relate back to um, why ABR still is important within a context um, and beginning to understand um, what's going on. And also, you know, for more importantly, a lot of the people involved in these studies are of working age, um, unlike of osteoarthritis that perhaps uh, becomes more problematic as people get older and are into retirement age. Hemophilic arthropathy affects uh, young adults, um, adults of working age. And so an increasing number of problem joints came along with an increasing loss of work productivity as well, and the ability to, to be at work, what we call presenteeism. Not associated with the chest, chest data set, but actually other things that we, we sort of knew um, around sort of having problem joints and arthropathic joints is that if you have ankle and knee arthrop um, arthropathy associated with hemophilia, that um, the most pain interference that's reported is in daily mobility of activities of living and work, which begins to reflect back to the chest data set. Increasing age comes with increasing joint pain. Increasing pain interferes with work attendance. Increasing joint damage brings pain and poor mental health. So that begins to then affect your mood and uh, things like anxiety. And overall reported function is worse if you're experiencing both acute and chronic pain at the same time from a joint that is affected with hemophilic arthropathy. We know too that moving around with a problem joint, with a joint that's affected with hemophilic arthropathy is hard work. People with hemophilic uh, people with hemophilia and arthropathy, um, they use more energy when they walk than those without hemophilic arthropathy. And the suspicion is that this is an attempt to economize energy to keep your center of gravity uh, working well um, with your ankle and knee arthritis. Interestingly, in this work was done in osteoarthritis, so not people with hemophilia, but actually people with osteoarthritis in both their knees and feet. Um, this uh, team found that walking and standing was 14 times more difficult if you had arthritis present in both those joints. And doing stairs was five times more difficult. And rising from the chair was up to four times more difficult. So you can kind of see moving away from only seeing bleeding um, uh, as a problem or looking at the definition and actually beginning to look at other human factors that you begin to see a lot more potential issues uh, that people may be living with or coping with. More generally, looking at physic, things like physical activity, um, even on prophylaxis, children are not as active as their peers. Um, we know in Canada uh, that severe, children with severe hemophilia who were on prophylaxis were actually more sedentary than those with mild and moderate. And in Mexico, where there's um, was limited access to prophylaxis or regular treatment for some kids, that they were 77% of them were very low um, or very inactive. In the adults, it's a much worse story. Um, that likely comes along with presence of more arthropathy. Um, the USA, only 14% of the patients, um, and that's one study, were active, 20, a quarter were sedentary. So they spent huge amounts of their time just not moving at all. Um, in Germany, uh, only 55% were really active, even though most people thought it was a good thing to do. And in Ireland, they were well below a European average. So again, we're beginning to get into perhaps what's viewed as softer issues and softer problems, but being more physically active and having the ability to be physically active is, is good for your health. And it becomes a public health issue for everybody if physical activity is, is affected. <laughs> And we need to think, why is it, is it really just the presence of, of hemophilic arthropathy? Is it the fear of bleeding? Is it the fear of pain? We need to begin to understand more um, what these problems are with these joints. And <clears throat> the burden of hemophilia traditionally has been around bleeding, 
infusion arthropathy and the comorbidity that has come with that. So on the face of it, this fits very well with the idea around um, target joints, bleeding joints, and, and then therefore treating the target joint with factor. And if a joint bleeds enough, it becomes arthritic. But if you begin to think more from a problem joint perspective and start to think about the human element of that, the burden is more than bleeding. The burden is about perceived joint function. It is about psychosocial stress. It is about pain. It is about quality of life. Yes, there is arthritis. Yes, there may be bleeding. Yes, there may be a burden of infusion, but there is a huge amount of other things going on at any one time with any one person about any one joint. And so it becomes highly complex to live with, with all of this, but it becomes uh, problematic for us as healthcare providers to get a better understanding um, of what's going on and what we can all do to, to, to help um, perhaps ease some of the burden of this. And this takes us into sort of looking at how we would begin to manage the, the burden of this idea of problem joints. And <clears throat> I very much see this as, as sort of getting to know someone better and the person who's living with the problem joint. So rather than, than view them through the lens of their hemophilia, view them through the lens of a person who for most of the year let, manages their own hemophilia, for most of the year manages their own pain, for most of the year finds a way around living with their problem joint, understand their needs, understand their history, their history of hemophilia, their history of treatment, um, fears and worries. Actually, you know, how much of, of, of fear of more damage, fear of bleeding is actually in, in sort of tied in with a joint being perceived as a problem. Um, understand the barriers. The barriers may be internalized, the barriers may be self-imposed, but the barriers may also be social, um, social, socioeconomic, uh, you know, environmental. Um, understand what has worked before, um, what have been successes, and also ideally what have been failures. Uh, most people will have probably figured out a workaround at some point in their life to it. And it may be that a joint becomes problematic because someone may have run out of ideas or has, has run out of, of space to try and uh, sort of accommodate that, that joint or that problem. But ultimately it's what matters to them. And this begins to get down to the nitty gritty of a, a problem joint is, is a problem to the person who's experiencing it. Um, and every knee, may not be the same. Um, every ankle problem may not be the same. Um, and, you know, there is an issue with the system and that's the healthcare systems, the medical systems, the sort of access to the people you need systems. It's looking at what the system can do and can do better and should do better, um, but also within that what's realistic and what's not. And I think importantly, it's acknowledging that starting to think a bit more broader about this idea around problem joints is that time is needed. Um, if we as healthcare professionals and clinicians are, are um, beginning the process of, of a workout and a work through you around problem joints, that there's no short fix and it may well take, it takes perhaps as long as it takes. Um, and that with it, that in itself brings, may bring problems with um, <clears throat> payers and access to healthcare and, and number of appointments and, and cost, um, but it is something that we need to consider as well, because it may well be adding to this idea around burden of problem joints. And so maybe taking that picture I had earlier on around the sort of the biological and, and sort of placing living with a problem joint within this idea of a biopsychosocial continuum, that living with hemophilia and a problem joint may or may not have an effect on your mental health which may or may not have an effect on your family or your friends or your employment. And actually the danger of viewing a problem joint or a person with hemophilia only through a social lens or a psychological lens or a biological lens um, does a disservice because all three, although they're shown separately here, they don't coexist separately. They, they are part of what makes us human. And style all of that, how we, work through that continuum is actually how we manage well when we are presented with problems, but perhaps how we fail to manage well um, if there are imbalances or there um, are issues or blockages in some of that continuum. And I think being able to sort of view 
the, the humanistic quality of someone living with problem joints um, begins to give us a much better understanding and, and, of, of what we may be able to change. Um, also what we may not be able to change. And I think it's important to identify that as well and not waste time trying to change the things that we can't change um, if it's sort of system or environmental or socioeconomic. <clears throat> and that brings me to this idea of person-centered care. Um, and person-centered care, uh, essentially I think is the crux of, of long-term condition management, of hemophilia management, of, of problem joint management, of chronic pain management, that putting the person at the center of, of, of the care provision when you're trying to personalize that care, that the care that you're providing is coordinated if there are many people involved, um, that the care enables someone to be part of the, their, their own uh, way forward. Um, and it is provided with dignity, respect and compassion um, and acknowledging the, the life experience and the, the valuable experience of people living with hemophilia um, and what they bring to that. And this sort of um, sits within this sort of house of, of, of care um, as a model. Um, but actually, if you do person-centered care well, actually, you, you get sort of involvement with informed people that are informed healthcare professionals, informed family, informed caregivers, informed uh, people with hemophilia. You get buy-in from organizational support uh, processes and you have this idea of committed uh, partnership working that actually the power changes that I, you know, we as clinicians are your clinicians all of the time on paper, but actually you as hemophilia, you living with hemophilia manage your condition 99.9% .9 of the time. We're visitors into that, that, that way of your management and actually shared uh, understanding and empathy towards each other and actually seeing what, what both parties bring um, is, is really, really important. And then there's always the sort of, what can we do to make problem joints better? Um, I think ultimately we have to listen, learn and understand better um, from each other. Uh, as a physio, I'm always gonna look at exercise, movement and rehabilitation strategies. Um, and that sort of fits along with behavioral uh, science and behavioral uh, medicine. Um, supported living and actually that may well be changes to someone's house that may be provision of access to other parts of the care team that may be provision with um sort of medicines reviews or or having someone overseeing living uh well um share knowledge and develop support and it may be things like uh, offering braces slings walking aids that are short term medium term long term um it may well be motorized wheelchairs, you know, going from it, although it may look like an end stage, actually being safe and mobile and pain free and independent in a motorized wheelchair may for some people be the, the life changing opportunity that it, that it presents to them. And I think often looking at complementary and alternative medicine approaches, if it's safe and it provides uh, no inherent danger, and I'm talking about things like acupuncture or um, spiritual uh, interventions, anything like that, I think it's worth pursuing uh, as long as it's safe and um, the, everyone participating is a qualified practitioner um, and that your healthcare providers know as well. Um, because again, this comes back to belief systems and, and, and how you want to live better with what you've got. So my final thoughts, uh, hemophilic bleeding is burdensome. Um, that, that's a no brainer, that, that is so obvious it almost doesn't need to be said. Um, I suppose maybe what's less obvious or what's less said is that so are the long-term effects and actually the accumulating long-term effects of bleeding. Um, and everyone has different lived experiences of those effects. They have a different lived experience of their life with hemophilia and their coping. Um, and, and we as healthcare professionals need to understand better the burden on the people that we are, are that are in our care. And I think together we need to try and find ways of, of managing that burden better um, and actually beginning to sort of see um, <clears throat> how we can help each other, how we can uh, see some light through that tunnel. And that has come from sharing knowledge, experiences and opinions. And I think that is the way 
to do that. Um, and it's always very cheesy, but it is a team effort. Um, and that, that is something that uh, we, we can't really forget. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is a very pretty picture of London in the sun, which we haven't had the last few days. But um, uh, so thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Paul. We appreciate it. Great presentation. We do have several questions that came in. Um, I will start with this one, sir. <clears throat> Are there tools for healthcare providers and patients to use to have conversations about bleeding, about bleeding and ABR? I think there are there are there are tools in the sense that I think that the the patient review is very much around have you bled yes no how many bleeds have you had in the last six months, we have a, um, a patient reporting system called HemeTrack where patients record all of their prophylaxis treatments on HemeTrack but they also record their bleeding episodes, and so that for us is an early warning sign of of perhaps identifying bleeding in somebody who we would say shouldn't be having bleeding. So that would be that they're on good prophylaxis, they're on enhanced prophylaxis. Um, but the ABR is, I think it's whatever works almost locally, um, really. So we have a very structured approach to it, but then I know others may do more of a recall. So so relying on the, the, the patient in front of you to, to, to remember. And I don't think that's the best option because I mean, can you remember what you had for breakfast yesterday? So often episodic bleeding is treated at the time, eases off, has no, maybe no pain after, and then is forgotten about. So sometimes some of those smaller bleeds aren't actually maybe being recorded. <clears throat> great, great. Thanks, Paul. Next question comes in. Um, looking at the span of treatment advance is wonderful. But what about those without access? What is the role of uh, physio, uh, physiotherapists when treatment is not available? People think you can't use a uh, physical therapist without treatment, but what is your thought about this? Um, I, I think you can do physio with no treatment. Um, I've, some of the best physio I have witnessed and seen has been in countries with little or no access to treatment. I have been to Burma, I've been to India, and I've seen the amazing work the physios do there. We're a, a training center for physios who come to us from countries um, from East and West Africa, from South America, where, you know, physio is a, a, a magic bullet to some degree that we, if, if the human is moving and they're not bleeding in their day-to-day -day life, actually the physio can work with what is there to, to sort of progress and, and make things better. Um, it, there's always an inherent risk, but that, you know, we, there's a point, there's a, there's comes a point where the risk benefit is if you're doing nothing and bleeding, you may as well do something with the physio. If, you know, if you're bleeding anyway, that there's a point where actually there's enough anecdotal evidence out there to suggest that if we get muscles and joints working just even a notch above what they're currently doing, that we may well improved bleeding. Um, there's lots of sort of patient stories that we're beginning to hear now around. And certainly we learned a lot of that from <clears throat> the inhibitors where for a long time we had very little good adequate treatment for inhibitors, but we were still pushing physio and we were able to sort of get changes there. So I am a proponent of physio always, and I do not believe you need to have cover of treatment beforehand. The physio should not be making you bleed. That, that, that is my, my bottom line is the, the physio should not be making you bleed. Um, and if it does, then th that needs to be, that's either the joint is very, very friable, that actually the synovium has got to a point where even normal activity is setting it off. Well, then, you know, that is, but even then physio is about learning to, you know, hard to mobilize that joint, actually starting to calm those things down and actually move the rest of the human that's attached to the immobilized limb. You know, it's always about the person rather than always see what you can do rather than focus on what you can't. Great, 
Great. Thanks, Paul. Questions are pouring in here now. Um, <laughs> next one comes in. How can patients and caregivers help influence the concept of patient-centered care when engaging with their comprehensive care team? Um, <clears throat> the magic question. <laughs> I think hemophilia being the rare disease, hemophilia often being treated in very specialist centers. Um, I think for, for some, in my experience, I think perhaps hemophilia is sometimes already a bit further ahead than other, some other conditions because there are very good relationships with treaters. There's often very good relationships, lifelong relationships with nurses and social workers. And I, I think person-centered care, this is perhaps a different name. You know, so person-centered care is different from comprehensive care. So you can have comprehensive care and see everybody you need to see. But if those people don't talk to each other, it's not really comprehensive care. You know, there's no shared story. There's no shared narrative. And the shared narrative is the patient's narrative that actually, you know, what can we do for you today? And, and why, you know, what is different about your joint that's been arthritic for 20 years? And why, what has changed for you now that you're coming to ask, is there anything we can do? It's actually starting to shift the conversation and the, the narrative is held by you as a person with hemophilia and actually pushing your narrative and actually beginning to sort of sway those conversations around okay yes I've had no bleeds but I've had four days of work this month and actually that bothers me more than my not bleeding so I would like someone help about how you know I can so perhaps it's it's maybe saying yes but <laughs> um and and being brave enough to change that conversation in clinic and lead not even lead the conversation in clinic because the clinic is about you and your condition and so you know the power structure around who who leads the story great, great. i'm a big believer come i i love patients that come with a list if you have a list of questions and a list of worries i i'm very happy to go through them with you you know i think coming prepared is I'm a big fan of that. I don't see that as a threat. I see that as active engagement. Yeah, great, great advice. Thanks, Paul. Um, next question comes in. Um, women experience joint pain and bleeds, but can often be dismissed. What recommendations do you have for women to ensure their joint pain and or joint blades are also being taken seriously? Yes. <clears throat> I, yeah, this is a problem. This is not to get too gender political, but there is a misogyny in haemophilia because traditionally haemophilia has been seen as a male disease. Um, there is a misogyny often around, underlying that around sort of uh, pain in women as well. Um, and actually the being, being disbelieved and being discounted is, is a terrible start to any, any intervention and any sort of um, <clears throat> uh, any, any clinical uh, intervention. My, I suppose, a way around it, again, coming back to that hold on your own narrative and actually sort of saying, yes, I have bled, these are problems, but actually, you know, I, I feel very much that this is, this is a problem, could I see the physio? And actually, where you may get the support of your narrative from someone else, perhaps it's not uh, giving you that support. And it may well be that you need to find advocates within the system to push forward your, your view and, and to get access to, to what you need. Um, most of our haemophilia clinics, for example, are set up where we do, carriers, as they're so-called, the women with haemophilia aren't in our, our normal haemophilia review clinics. Although we have physio present all the time in the center, so actually we can get pulled into that clinic, but even sort of that's why I was talking about an institution and, and, and things that it may be bigger <clears throat> it may be a bigger problem but those bigger problems can chip away and actually but I think find an advocate it may be a nurse it may be the physio it may be a social worker but uh, perhaps find someone on the team that can listen to you fight your corner and actually get the care you need yeah Great, thank you, Paul. Um, next question comes in. Uh, 
What's your expectation of future joint outcomes in children and young people only treated with Team Libra and other non-factor agents in the pipeline, recognizing that factor may still be needed for breakthrough bleeds? Uh, the hope and the dream is that we have no overt joint disease. Um, already we can see that the, the face of bleeding has changed with the with Emmy and the sort of the disruptive therapies. Um, they do present other more sort of subtle clinical problems where if there is trauma, we're sometimes caught on the hop, but we're not entirely sh sort of, it doesn't almost present like a classical bleeding with trauma whilst on Emmy. I think the short term, what we're seeing is that it's, it's amazing. Um, but we are still, very, you know, this is a new drug. We're still in the very early days of, of how we progress forward and how you, what normal looks like. And I don't really like the word normal, but, you know, if, if we're not seeing on standard joint assessment any changes in the kids, that is not perhaps enough to say all is well. Um, there's a team at Great Ormond Street looking at other ways of, of joint assessment that involves performance and physical performance and actually hopping and skipping and jumping and all that, all this sort of high, much higher level stuff that kids without hemophilia should be able to do no problems and have the same times. So we certainly physios are already starting to look at other ways of, and then of course you've got uh, ultra, ultrasound and things like that. But I think from, you know, I think it'll be five or 10 years before we can say, and this, this current batch of kids coming through are going to be assessed to death because it is a new drug. And, you know, we're going to be getting all of these um, performance measures in there, which I think is the way forward. I think that is exactly, you know, we need to identify that if you've categorically removed the, a huge risk of breathing, we need to make sure that the potential to be as normal as you want to be is still being taken. So we may identify other things there, but I, I certainly, it's, it's all good. Um, we're, it is quite amazing, really. Uh, the change to some people's lives being on these these newer therapies. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, next question comes in. Um, this this may be a, a bit of a repeat, but um, I think there's a little bit of a different approach um, to the question here. I completely agree that optimal treatment should be person centered instead of disease centered, and that it should be a team effort. What are your experiences with the transition from disease centered to person centered within a multidisciplinary team? I think our, from my own experience, our multidisciplinary team is, has been in existence for years. And so we have a much uh, flatter structure. So we work really well together in the sense that there's, um, we have uh, each know what the other one is good at. And our review clinics are set up that there's a doctor, a nurse, a physio, and a psychologist in the room together so everybody's hearing the same person patient story but we are interpreting the story differently but this the single story is told once to everybody and then we as a team do the bits that we're good at within that story and then we have a meeting later on in the week where we look back at the clinic talk about the story and make sure that we are all in the same boat and we have the same understanding and so that's just how we've sort of embedded person-centered care the where the, the person's story is what we're interested in because the hemophilia is almost besides the point like the hemophilia is we know the hemophilia is well looked after but actually you know we are dealing with lots of people with many problems like many joint problems but also sort of social problems there's um you know, family problems, things that don't on the face of it seem that obvious. Um, and I may be picking up something in my assessment, like, oh, that's something there is not right. And I then may chat to the psychologist, but she might have the, the bit that's missing that makes my understanding better. So that's how we've embedded person-centered care. So we take the, that, this, this, the shared storytelling in clinic and we interpret it all sort of with the patient, but also with each other. So it's a constant sort of 
and full sharing. It's, it's communication. All these things, it's always about communication. And, you know, if we've had a patient who was communicating really well with us for a long time and then isn't, that for us, we know them so well that something's not right and we'll do other things to, to investigate. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. But yeah, it's a, I think it's a two-way flow. Well, multiple, well, not even two-way flow. It's a often torrential flow of information depending on what's going on. But it's making sense of this, the story, the narrative. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Paul. I know we're coming up against the hour here, but if you don't mind sticking with us, maybe for a couple more questions, Paul. No, no, it's fine. Great, great. Um, so next question comes in. In terms of the system difficulties, how might we change the minds of payers who tend toward bleed justification policies for treatment? And then are techniques like MSKUS or microbleeds helping our discussions around bleeding or is it still making it about justification? It's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, and that's why I put the system in because there's no point attempting whole scale change if the system just isn't prepared to shift um we we find chinks in the system um as physios certainly in the uk so we uh the hjhs which is the hemophilia joint health score is a physical assessment um which we managed to get put on the service specification for hemophilia so it is legally it's a legal obligation of every hemophilia center to provide that and to report it back to the payers but we use that to get more physio so then when that was on the service spec, they had to pay for physio, more physio. So then when we got more physio in there, we then started to change the rules about what we wanted to do when we were in there. And so we, we used the system to, to leverage what you know, we were doing. And so once you then have a voice at that table, you can begin to, 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 to change things like that. And it comes back to coherent team and communication that actually if patients and their things like the NHF and EHAD and the Haemophilia Society and the EHC and specialist bodies and so specialist physios and the haematologists, if everybody begins to be saying the same thing that actually, yes, bleeding is one thing, but outcomes, because payers, ultimately it's all about outcomes and numbers and figures. Actually, outcomes could be even better if we looked at this differently and we did things differently. You know, but I think it takes, ma it takes, it, uh, it takes mass uh, support. Um, low, lone voices, I think certainly in, a, in a, the system in the US, lone voices will get drowned out by the, the noise. So I think it's about maybe a coherent group making a different noise and, and shifting. But we've certainly, yeah, we have been, been cunning in, in what we've done to change the system to our benefit for patients. Um, and now we're at the stage where we or public funders for research will not fund any haemophilia specific research that has not been identified as important to people with haemophilia. So we've come full circle. They are now involved in, in how we fund patient-centric research. Uh, but that has taken a long time. That hasn't been something that just appeared. Um, but there is, there, I think, I have hope that things like this can change. It's just taking every opportunity you can to, to get in with, with things. Yeah, that's great, Paul, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep you on just for one last question here, Paul, if you don't mind. Um, telemedicine has become a new norm during the pandemic, but what takeaways post pandemic will you take as a physiotherapist in connecting with patients? And were you able to successfully work with patients remotely during the pandemic? We were, uh, we are, well, we are, I say we were, we are now more successful. Um, we were less successful with the pandemic kicked off, but I think it was the, um, like everybody was IT and it was ill-prepared Ill and ill-thought out ideas about how we can do this. Um, we personally are very excited and delighted that we have this option now of of effective platforms. We, um, most of our patients have our email addresses and anyway, will be contacting us continuously. Um, but certainly the, the pandemic brought home to us around 
ways that we can deliver expert comprehensive care locally. Um, and that is that for us has been the massive positive. Uh, Haemophilia comprehensive care works because often there are, it's a, in a hyper regional center where many patients have to travel a long way to get there and then have to park and whatever. Um, whereas, you know, we're, we're rare diseases often get bumped uh, and get uh, have problems in, in pandemics such as this because of huge movement of staff, things shutting down non-urgent attendances at hospitals. Um, but I think we've managed well to keep in contact and we certainly are looking for going forward at blended, what we would call a blended approach to, we've been able to do face-to-face -face, uh, 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 virtual consultations and virtual triage. And if we were sufficiently worried, we were able to get the patient to come see us, but actually we're then able to continue really tight follow-up and offer support without the need to bring somebody back 150 minutes to the center. So I think the future in that respect is that if we can make it work to deliver really good, you know, excellent comprehensive care, but locally and finding the ways to do that. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, the options are, are brilliant. Um, Wi-Fi and IT permitting, obviously, um, or all of that, but, and then you know, not to look at digital exclusion and stuff. So the assumption that everybody has gone virtual because um, you know, it's there's nothing beats a face-to-face -face sort of somebody in the flesh and having a chat. And, you know, many of our hemophilia patients have been registered with us since 1969 or 1970. You know, they've come to the center for 50 years. So it's kind of, it's part of their life as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very, very insightful. Yeah, really appreciate that. Paul, thanks for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. I hope it was useful and maybe stimulates a bit of different discussion around this kind of thing. I think it's always good. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. It was great. Absolutely. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, We'd, uh, we'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us out there. Um, please note that uh, this webinar will be available on Friday, April 9th at, the, at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our other archive webinars. Um, also available is in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinars. Paul, I'd like to thank you one last time again for joining us and have a great evening. Take care. Lovely. Thank you. Bye.